make sure that you're regenerative in your mind and your health first and you will just like be at your best when you're at I find time. it so amazing that we've spoken to two guys who've gone down completely different journeys through life and they've arrived at the same conclusion about what's important and that is you know look after number one and then you can look after everyone else. What's up guys it's Elliot from Urban Farm it here again over the coming few days, we're going to be traveling all over the country, meeting different food growers and finding out what does it take and how do you start a food growing business. Here we are, and this afternoon we're talking with my bro, Jack's Patch. It's been a long time since Jack and I first started working together, and I've always admired the way that he approaches his market gardening, his eye for detail, his eye for quality, and more importantly, his eye for the, the environment. So, what have you been up to recently, Jack? Um, so, this year has been a scorch us. I've been doing a lot of stuff off the farm as well as on the farm, so consulting people on their own permaculture journey, uh, building setups in people's gardens. Um, as well as having a market garden run, running alongside, we've got the mushrooms, the microgreens, they're still churning out. It's my fourth season here, so it's slowly developed over time. Just this patch, which was like an eighth of an acre, and it's gone to a quarter of an acre, adding the container as well. And really it's just like developing my knowledge base, developing my network, like meeting people like yourself. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just trying to inspire as many people as possible to go on this journey with us, because ultimately this yeah. is the future of growing. Yeah. Uh, that's what I feel. And um, yeah, we're just really trying to inspire as many people as possible. Yeah, you've been uh, a real busy boy. And I think we're gonna take a little look around your patch, sort of see how you've developed it over time, and you know, hopefully snaffle a couple of nuggets of wisdom from you. Uh, so here we are in amongst Jack's courgettes. Um, I believe this was the first uh, area that you started farming on the patch. Uh, maybe you could just sort of tell us a little bit about what it was like when you first started, how you went about choosing the plants that you chose, and yeah, like any, any other sort of hints and tips around, you know, methods? Yeah, great question. Um, so this is like heavy clay. Um, and to be honest, I was quite lucky because it, what, what I'd done to it by putting in all that organic matter, it did mulch down eventually and now like like it is it is good soil you put you could you bring yeah, back beautiful. this uh bring back this drawing like every every shovel has got like tons of worms in like you're bringing the life to it by build like build it and they'll come um, so clay's no bad thing yeah clay's not bad clay holds loads of nutrients and it just needs access so like uh you just need to feed it and it will feed you yeah you feed the soil it <laughs> feeds you it's Love it. very basic very very basic but like you bring the worms to the surface they're going to bring that new organic matter and bring it into the ground so they're aerating it for you. But I'm not really against digging first year, so like break it to fix it. It's like land chiropractory, like mm. you, you fix it um, and then after that you, you do no dig. It. Stuff like comfrey and whatever breaks it up. And if you see thistles in your continuously coming back, they're trying to break that old ground. So sometimes maybe the first year, rotivate it, like get that aeration, break it up. But then after that, you're just going to flood it with nutrients. Nice. So, okay, so, so soil type is something to look for. You know, I think, you know, what, from the point of view of practicality, making things easy, what's maybe something that you don't want to see when you first start a patch? Uh, great question. Again, I, I notoriously would be against a place that's too open. Mm. So like if a farmer gave you like a section of their land, open land, just wind. Wind is the killer of plants and killer of polytunnels as well. So you want <laughs> Some to be, prove that. Yeah, you, you want to be really careful with that. You want to try and get like natural wind uh, barriers. You want to make sure that the, the soil's not been like notoriously sprayed. Um, and also just having like, make sure south facing, you want to get as much heat in the garden as possible to, to grow like a bountiful of like Mediterranean plants mm. as well. Mm. Access and irrigation are the first two things you should just kind of like map out. Like irrigation, getting water from here to the furthest part of the plot, like Key those plants are gonna they're gonna die the first. If it's a hot day like today, they're gonna struggle the first. I mean, here over time, I didn't have much time to think, but it was nice and flat. 
you had the greenhouse and it has like a natural hedgerow. You can see some trees here, so for wind, I'm good. And I've got access to a tap for water. Access, uh, when compost wants to be dropped off, it's dropped off outside the gate. I'm not lugging it miles. Yeah. So, um, these are all simple, simple things that I feel like can slightly get looked over through it, the excitement of getting land, but mm. it's, I, they're, they're like the first things I tick off my like checklist. I'd All right, say. so yeah, we know, we know a little bit about what to look for in the land, but let's have a walk around and check out some of the plants. So ultimately, when you're running a market garden or a permaculture farm, the produce, the fruit, the veg, it's your product. And choosing the right product is really, really important. So from the point of view of how easy slash successful slash productive it is to grow and where the demand is, maybe you could just run us through a couple of your primary hero products here um, and explain why. So I think with a small space, it's all about every square foot counts. So uh, your salad greens are a great one. Um, lettuce here, it's already wilting in the sun, but like multiple different types of salad. Um, with edible flowers thrown in you're making that like salad in the uk is notoriously quite bad like bags in supermarkets mm. they go off quite quickly yeah this stuff lasts a week two weeks in the fridge because it's a healthy plant multiple different leaves it looks good tastes good different textures uh, people love it as well at the markets and high price so about 15 pound a kilo and you can grow it is that market it. price yeah yeah, yeah cut come again and that's the same for chefs as it is retail because it's a high quality product yeah um, so you don't really lower it and then you've got like for example amongst a salad the uh, round circumferences and there's always gaps in between those round circumferences so you grow spring onion in between that's it. so like that that square, space that square foot has now a lettuce and uh, each corner has a spring onion a bunch of spring onions growing so you're maximizing two crops in one bed and you could go up to, well, I got to three crops in one bed by interplanting marigolds, marigolds, this is a permaculture trick, is notoriously gets rid of cutworm, but you add that to the salad. So as you're making, building a salad, you're cutting that in mm. as well. That's uh, an efficient way of doing it. Courgettes are great. Uh, you can pick them small, you can pick them big for marrows, depending on what people want. Notoriously, people like them small. You can also eat the flour. So like mm. uh, courgette with the flour, fetch is a that good is price. That is wonderful. Fetch is a good price. Well, one pound fifty I charge per one, and some chefs go like forty, fifty at a time. And you know, typically, like out of a out of a row, how you know what can you produce? What can you be taking daily? I mean, these things grow like grow like mad once they get going, don't Man, they? Man, they grow like hotcakes. Like the back of my van is filled with courgettes, but, <laughs> but they last. They last. You don't have to grow like multiple beds of them, but they are like they're a great bed filler. Like great weight of harvest. Yeah, looks good in a veg box. Uh, chefs love them. They always buy them. Uh, you can stuff the flour, you can eat the mouth flour, and you can actually eat the leaves. Like if you get like really good chefs, you can eat the leaves of them and the stem. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, tomatoes are always a winner. So you, uh, I always suggest having a polytunnel on your farm um, just to grow the Mediterranean stuff, but they're fetching a higher value. Tomatoes are like what everyone wants. Chefs want them as well. And I'll grow like different types. So you've got your Brad's, uh, cherry t uh, Brad's Atomic Grape. And then like I've got my cherry tomatoes, got chocolate cherry, get yellow, orange, and that variety, that mix just sells. Like yeah. it sells itself. You just put a picture on Instagram, people so want it. So do you it. do them as a mixed punnet? 100%. I yeah. never really grow them like per, like just red ones, just chocolate ones. Just grow as a Bit mix. Bit like with the mushrooms, isn't it? You know, a mixed yeah. punnet always draws the eye. Draws the eye, but also you're giving like, you know with the mushrooms, you've got different textures, you've got different, mm. like slightly different tastes depending on what it is. but. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's good to the eye. Like, so for the radish, these are like just a standard, uh, like, um, uh, cherry bell, a uh, nice round variety. Then you've got the French. Because that's a gorgeous example of one as yeah, well. Yeah, perfectly round. Yeah. And I didn't like radish before I grew them. Now these are like the most yeah, refreshing man. things on the patch. And they grow really abundantly uh, when you use a cedar and you harvest them. Then you can literally grab them out, bunch them quick. Same with carrots, same with beetroot. I think beetroot, people might see as like notoriously cheap, but like if you're growing uh, Italian chia gear, like the candy beets, yeah. you're growing golden beets, they sell. They sell well, and in the UK, we vinegarize beetroots straight away. Like you'd rarely see like good rare beets, and my stuff looks shinier than like the dirty ones in the supermarket. Yeah, and I think that's something else you touched on it there, that you know, you've got to think about, you know, 
can I sell this stuff? What gets a good price? But also how easy is it to work? You know, it's no good having uh, something that draws a high price, but it takes you five times as long to produce and harvest. You know, you need to, it's the, to choose the right crop is the balance of difficulty, complexity, resilience, and price. I mean, it, this stuff's gorgeous. And um, you touched on talking about it just then, your polytunnel. How about we go and take a look in there? Yeah, let's go. Nice. Well, it seems like just about every permaculture site um, or market garden has one of these, the glorious polytunnel. It can be quite a big output expense initially for somebody who's trying to do it on a shoestring on a budget. Maybe you could give us a bit of clarity about how important is a polytunnel, what does it give you, and you know exactly when's the right time to actually get one. So I, I personally believe just like it, it should be structured in your first price plan. It was one of the first things I bought, just because A, I knew that I wanted to grow like a higher value product in there. Mm -hmm. um, in If you start early in spring, you can get a product before the tomatoes get in, whether that's like your early root crops or like uh, just some greens. Uh, the beautiful thing is, is once the tomatoes come out, it goes full of greens. Yeah. And I'll give you an example, like um, I grow a lot of edible flowers and some edible flowers are like seasonal. So like late winter, early spring, and then the heat of the summer kills them off. And then they regrow in August. So there's a time where like, it would be nice to grow them in with the tomatoes, when the tomatoes come out, they're still growing into winter because they get a nice price value from mm, them. Mm. Because come winter, they're, they're dead again. But the polytunnel is just a protection as well. This is going to save you butt when growing, taking tomatoes from like maybe your home or your greenhouse or your indoor area to the next stage before they go in the ground. So this needs to be like a nursery as well. Yeah. So they, they need, it could be multiple factors that need to be factored in for your polytunnel. Is it just for tomatoes in the summer? Are you going to do winter produce? Do you need a nursery? Because then we're going to get, we get late frosts in like April, May, and it's like that place that protects everything before it goes into the garden. I mean, it gives you three months on your growing season either end, really, doesn't it? Yeah, I'll give you something, a tip that I do that I don't really see a lot of people doing is, is making elevation. So I have the crop bars in there. Obviously, I'm growing the, like, the tomatoes up, but in the winter and spring, I actually get an old uh, mesh gate and I string it up so there's like then another level and I can oh, put yeah. loads of trays on there. So I'm like using the heat of the polytunnel, but I'm getting like ground level and another level in the polytunnel. It's back to that thing, you know, is, is produce per square foot, every consideration you yeah, can make. Yeah, 100%, because I used to see like, oh, it's this huge dome, and but like everything's on the floor. I was yeah. like, well, I've got this inside space, let's bring it up a level. Um, so that's something to consider. When you're looking to set up your polytunnel, where on your patch should you try and put it? You know, is there, are there areas to avoid? Is, it, is there any nooks and crannies that you want to put it? Yeah, push somewhere where it's going to be sheltered from wind. So, <laughs> yeah, I just can't... Some I problems can't throughout this year, yeah. I can't stress that enough, really, because if it's exposed, it's just like, yeah, it's just going to get battered, to be honest. And, and they're built well, but they're not built perfect. Uh, there's always, there'll always be a better way of doing it. So... Another thing as well, it's not in a place that is going to shade anything else. So the sun goes up and over, south facing. Probably the most shade it, it goes is like literally the start of that bed. If you put it in, a, in an area in the other side of your south facing garden, like what, well, there's just, there's just so many multiple factors of giving shade, just being in a wrong clunky position. This is perfect. Skin all the sun, shading nothing else out and got wind protection. Yeah. These are like the three things. And ultimately you need the most nutritious part of the farm like mm. as well. You can physically do that, um, but also you just, just plan it well. Um, another little tip, permaculture tip, is I've got a little pond on the corner and of an evening, the pond reflects off the, off the water and heats up the polytunnel more. So very small pond, but it's just little tips and tricks that you need to think about when like planning your garden. A half a degree consistently over the season makes yeah, a big difference. Yeah, a huge difference. It can, it can matter whether you get green tomatoes at the end of October or they all redden up in time. Like yeah. small margins make big differences. That's it, yeah. So, you know, love the polytunnel. I think it's been clear from talking to Ed and you that it's, it's an essential for anyone looking to take this really seriously. Now, it's all well and good getting your crops growing really well, but there are challenges, pests, diseases, funguses. So, you know, maybe we could take a little look at how you deal with those. Yeah, sure. 
So one of the problems with creating a bountiful, intensive growing area is that uh, the wildlife also likes to come and capitalize on your hard work. Um, I know that many a grower has lost their hairline <laughs> to pests uh, and other organisms like that. Why don't you just tell us about, you know, two or three types that you've struggled with and how you've dealt with them in a non-chemical way. Cutworm is marigolds. Straight away, they hate the smell of the roots. Uh, just disperses them in your soil, gets them away from your lettuce. So grow marigolds with your lettuce. Yep. Um, micro ponds for slugs. So I'm going to say it again, you don't have a slug <laughs> problem. You have a frog, slug, uh, frog, duck, and hedgehog deficiency. Um, and what that does is you're giving a habitat to those predators. So you get the, get the predator back in the ecosystem, get rid of the problem. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna talk about leather jackets next. Um, nematodes is like the last point, port of call that you can buy in, but ideally you can get rid of them with chickens. Um, and also when hoeing the bed early in the season, if you see them, kind of just take them out of your bed, just get rid of them, uh, put them on a bird table. But you know, at the core of everything is observe ecology and implement what that does. Yep, exactly that. So uh, exactly what you said, observe. Uh, observe big permaculture principle. And if you can observe a problem and find a natural solution, because the natural solutions are just everywhere and it's just nature's way of fixing it, then bam, you're, you're, you're onto it. Smashed it. So, <laughs>But when you're deciding whether setting up a commercial permaculture or market garden is for you, there's a couple of cons key considerations. There's the business side of things, and then there's the growing side of things. From the business perspective, you really want to know who your market is, you know, what they want, what you're going to sell to them. It also pays to be really organized and look at investing in some key pieces of kit like the polytunnel over there. From the point of view of growing, you should always work with nature and choosing the right spot will set you up on the right foot. The last piece of the puzzle is self-care. Look after yourself. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And in the end, you'll come out on top.